We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, and I'm the Partnerships and Community Manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome our next guest onto the show, Gary Bowles. He is the author of The Next Rules of Work, Chair for the Future of Work Singularity University. Gary, thank you so much for being here. I know you're on a book tour right now. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> so I am uh, I'm a, a, a he, him, and all those sorts of pronouns kind of guy. Um, and uh, so first off, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. It's a topic that I really... I really find fascinating. Uh, and uh, just really briefly background. So uh, I uh, was never all that much interested in college, uh, barely escaped high school, but I sort of fell into the family business when I was young. And it just so happens that my father was, uh, was a writer of job hunting and career books. And uh, so I learned how to actually be a career counselor when I was 19 years old. Uh, but my takeaway, you know, that you should do what you love. Um, I ended up really, really enjoying high tech. So I sort of fell into Silicon Valley and uh, uh, ended up wearing a range of different hats and, and uh, eventually sort of coalescing around a lot of issues related to the future of work, future of learning and the future of the organization. But when as a kid, I cannot tell you that I had any really direct, great direction. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I barely escaped high school and sort of ended up doing a series of odd jobs, including working in the family business, because I really didn't know, I really didn't feel like I had much of a direction. So, so I wasn't one of those kids uh, for very early on who had this laser-like focus on the future direction. Um, I really found over time that I developed much more of my passions for a range of different things, the more that I explored in the world of work. I love that. I think that's really kind of important to just look at and like start thinking about what motivates us to be where we are today fast forward to right now you you wrote this book around the next rules of work and it's a lot around kind of the change that we're happening right now in the workplace but i know in our previous conversation we talked about you know there's no such thing as change management all that's left is yeah. managing the change what do you really mean by that what does that look like in practice so I've, I've had a thesis for quite some time. I, one of the wonderful things about Singularity University is that I get to pull from the thinking of a range of amazing brainiacs from around the world. And, um, and certainly, you know, we, we've talked about exponential change um, through Singularity University for quite some time. And that was originally sort of a mindset coined by Ray Kurzweil, the author of The Singularity is Near, who just talked about this rapidly increasing pace of change. <laughs> And so uh, I ended up uh, doing a series of courses on LinkedIn learning. And, um, and one of them uh, is, is actually called leading, leading change. And, uh, and the, the phrase that I used on you know, is um, change management, which is the way we kind of approach these things in the past is dead. And all that's left is uh, managing change. And so the, the mindset to start off with, and this is really the framing of the book of the next rules of work is mindset skill set and tool set. And so I always start with mindset. So what's the mindset of someone who leads in an organization? I'm sure we'll be talking about, I don't use the word leader a lot. <laughs> I can talk about why, but uh, somebody who leads in an organization, what's that mindset in a world of exponential change? Well, if you keep on thinking that there is some mythical future that's gonna be static, and you're planning for that future and you're writing the five-year plan for that future and then you're going to execute on that five-year plan and then along comes a virus i think you weren't exactly ready for exponential change and yeah. so how instead do you approach that really we have to have this belief that we are as humans constantly changing the world around us is constantly changing there are a set of te techniques really really effective techniques that you can follow that could help you to both understand the ways to get signals that changes are happening, to be able to help humans, to be able to recognize those signals and signals and response, respond to them. And then to get ahead of the curve, to not just wait to be reactive. Uh, there are companies that I know of that, you know, basically when, the, when COVID hit, were able to shift to a distributed work environment in 36 hours. Right. While there are other companies here, you know, a year and a half in are still trying to figure it out. <laughs> 
And so that's really what I think the mindset needs to be first off, is that it is about constant change. And we actually can learn the techniques to be able to do that effectively on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and let's dig deeper down into this concept of change as well. I think being proactive is really important too and having that mindset that change is something that's going to be constant. You need to be agile, you need to be dynamic and not static in your strategy or your process. What is the difference between incremental initiatives for organizational culture versus scaled and sustained processes? So the, the wonderful thing about culture, first off, is that in many cases, we it's one of those words where we kind of all use uh, this, this, we have the same word, but we use it for lots of different things. <laughs> and uh, and so culture can mean a lot, you know, to, to uh, depending upon who's talking about it. But 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 the first the first mindset I talk about is do you understand what your culture really is? What happens for a lot of people in who lead in organizations is you are a, rea- a reality and cultural distortion machine. You walk into a meeting and people adapt to you because of your role in the organization, especially if it's you know it's a hierarchical organization and you have a big title. And so first off, you often don't know what that culture is. You couldn't stop five different people in a hallway or on different Zoom calls and say, you know, what what is your lived experience of our organizational culture? Like, what are the top three things people need to do to be successful in this organization? You know, that sort of thing. You normally will not get consistency. You might get people parroting what they saw on the micro kitchen wall. (laughs) <laughs> but you normally won't get the same experience from everybody. So the first is to understand what your culture is. Um, second is to then think about, all right, what, what, do you, what do you think you should do to co-create the vision of the culture that you want? It can't just be the leadership team, which is normally a black box that sits at the top of that organizational hierarchy that goes off into a room and decides what the corporate's corporation's culture should be, and then comes back like bringing tablets down from the mount and says, all right, here's what you guys need to implement. Instead, it should be a co-created process that is continuous. So, and then w- once you've got that and you really are all, you've got some level of agreement about the kinds of cult- kind of culture that the organization should have, the kind of behavioral activity that you want to encourage, how does that get done? There are some organizations that look at the Venn diagram of the culture they've surveyed, they know what culture they have, that's really important, and the culture they're trying to design. And there's a lot of overlap. Like, oh, wait a minute, we're, we're actually pretty well along that task. Now, it might be different if you're a big organization, it's going to be different in different divisions, different departments, different people who lead different parts of the organization are going to either exhibit or fight against those cultural artifacts. But you first understand it, and then you understand how far you have to go. There are incremental changes, which is the behavior at any team level within the organization that you have to continue to do. But you might find that there is actually a really big disparity between what culture you understand you have today and the culture you're driving towards. And that's where really systemic change needs to happen. So I I don't say you, you should be doing those team level activities. You should be continually helping teams to be able to effectively work together to be as what I call involving as possible, to be able to help people to grow and so on. We can talk more about those cultural anchors, but on an organizational level, uh, it's pretty clear. There, you know, there's really good research that says about 15% of all organizations that try to go through scaled cultural change succeed. So that's an 85% failure rate. I don't know many companies <laughs> that would embark on uh, rolling out a new product with you know, an 85% likelihood of failure. So, uh, and so instead we need to think of, well, what's the process that you see organizations go through that do that effectively? Very briefly, it's the shared, the co-creation process that I was talking about. It's a set of processes that continually roll out in different parts of the organization, authentic discussions about what the current culture is and what, where it needs to go. It's a lot of cultural anchors around behavior. It's wonderful to talk about mindset, and we should, but it's also about the skill set that people develop and the ways that they interact with each other. And then it's rewards and incentives. How will you continually instantiate into the organization's culture the way that you tell people, yes, that's the kind of behavior we want. That's the kind of results we want. That's the kind of culture we should be building together and have that be reinforced in a way that people 
actually resonates with people so that they'll keep on doing. I think that co-creation piece is really important in understanding where you are today. I think a lot of folks say, okay, we're going to change our company culture, but they don't have a pulse on how employees are actually feeling right now. Everybody is having a different experience and those experiences all combine together to create one kind of employee experience too. And the reality is not everybody is starting from blank slate. Everybody is at a different part of that journey too. So you need to have that foundation, have that understanding. You mentioned culture anchors, and I think people managers and managers in general are one of the culture conduits or, you know, the person that you are interacting with on a daily basis, as opposed to the leadership team or your people HR team, what have you. Um, And they manage information coming up and down the pipeline, as we talked about. Um, How can companies provide tools, resources, and frameworks for their managers to be their best? Absolutely. So it, there's there's no question that is the pivot point for culture inside the organization. Um, you know, Gallup does its its engagement study every year, and they find you know we they've had a significantly uh, continually descending drop in in engagement in uh, people for people in their jobs in organizations, certainly in the United States. And the and what they will continually refer to is the relationship with the manager as defining whether or not they feel engaged with their work, engaged with the organization, appreciated in what they do. And that manager is often the one who is sending all the signals as to whether or not they're doing good work or they're, they're, there's still something that uh, they need to pick up on to be able to do better. And so, so the first is every individual who is in, again, I don't I sound like the word police sometimes. I don't use the word manager very often. I try to say team guy because I want to bring a different mindset. I want, I want us to be thinking about that that old role of the manager was about, you know, sort of command and control and the one who you know, was defining what people did in a given day. And I want this newer role of, of a guide who is continually asking the right questions and helping people to grow. Uh, as the, the new mindset and the new skill set to develop. In terms of the tools to provide, which is a combination of the techniques and the technologies that we can provide, there's a range of different ways we can help that team guide to become much better at it. The first is that they need to do some level of self-inventory. They kind of have to know what tools they're working with. What are your best loved skills? What are the ways that, what's your style of interacting as somebody who, who guides a team? What are the things that you most want to learn and develop and to grow in? Because if it's all focused just on the team, you as an individual get sort of left out of the equation. But it's actually how you show up in your job that has the greatest impact on the people around you. It's not just the teachable moments that you use as somebody who guides a team. It's what they watch in your behavior. And if you are continually trying to be in control of the situation. You're the one who always has to have the best ideas. You're the one who continually is determining the priorities of the team, telling them what the priorities are and enforcing those priorities. Then what you're doing is, if that's the kind of culture you want and the kind of culture that everybody has agreed they're trying to co-create, awesome. Then you're reinforcing it. (laughs) Probably isn't what you're guiding towards. We're finding in the COVID era that, oh, maybe you actually do need to care about the lived experience about every single person on your team. And they do have lives and they are whole people. And you probably do need to understand more about their own skills and how they can be continually helping to solve the problems of today and tomorrow and to do that on a collaborative fashion. So what do you need? You need first to be able to do that self-inventory, understand your own skills. Secondly, you need to have the kinds of agreement with whoever you think of as people you're reporting to or what, what the actual results of what you're doing and how you are changing the way you interact with your team, how all of that is coming together and how you feel you will judge the effectiveness of you do, those activities that you're performing. And then hopefully that gets baked into how you get compensated, your rewards with the organization. So it all is nice and, you know, and fractal. The sec- second is it's really important to have a finger on the pulse so that you can continually help to align and be aligned with your team. Now there's organizations I point to in, in the book, The Next Rules of Work, I point to organizations like Asana, which uh, basically took two years, the founders took two years 
to plan the culture of the organization before they hired a single person. Mm -hmm. And because they built software that's all around alignment, they actually bake that sets of processes around alignment in. How do you agree what the goals of each person in the team and the goals of the team are and how those are aligned to the strategic goals of the organization, how those continually stay aligned. And there's a range of different software tools that can help you to do that, where you're continually putting the activity of every worker into some form that's digital so that everybody else can see what's going on. And you can all keep your interactions aligned and you can keep aligned with the culture of the organization which hopefully also has a commitment to this kind of transparency and openness. And then the third is how can you continually be working to be authentically connected to the goals of the organization and the needs of the organization's range of stakeholders? You can find that a lot of organizations put all this cultural change stuff in place, and then they stay anchored in just what the value that they're looking to deliver is for their, their shareholders. And not so much for customers, not so much for other workers, not so much, you know, the, the more you can have this expanded view of the stakeholders of the organization and everybody from the team level throughout the organization is committed to it and committed to authentic processes and has the ability to keep on doing a finger check. You know, how are we connect, you know, Are we getting there? Are we contributing to the kinds of goals in making happier customers and being more authentically connected to our communities and so on? All of that can help you to continually keep the culture of the organization developing in the direction you want. It sounds like for team guides, it's really important for them to also build relationships, build meaningful connections and trust and kind of listening to their team too, having a pulse on what's going on, alignment, co-creation, collaboration in terms of what you're discussing as well, really caring about the lived experiences and having empathy and leading with vulnerability uh, to really understand what motivates employees, how uh, guides can really help them too. How do you see a real culture of employee kind of trust and listening manifesting at successful organizations? So really passive and active listening happening. So first off with human relations, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different uh, cues um, and, and coding that we look for and how we interact with each other. But you've hit the nail on the head for ultimately, if what we're looking for is to help a variety of humans to collaborate together, to be able to channel their human energies and solve problems for their stakeholders. That's kind of how I think of the organization and work. If that's what we're looking for, then we, we know in a range of other contexts, whether it's school, sports, or other things that we'd learned as we were growing older and coming into the world of work, we know from those situations that the more trust that we can develop between each other, the more we can accomplish. Now, there's a, there's a number of different things that you can do inauthentically <laughs> to use the word trust as a bludgeon, right? And so you can, there's, 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 there are organizational cultures where essentially the, the way you get trust is by exerting power. It's like, I'm, I'm going to lead and you're gonna follow me and that's how I'm gonna prove I'm worthy of your trust and you're worthy of my trust. And if you're not following me, if I go in this direction and you go in another direction, well, then you don't trust me and I can't trust you. That might work fine again in cultures that are very command and control and very hierarchically structured. If what you're trying instead is to authentically build the kinds of connections between people we were talking about, uh, you've mentioned a couple, but there's, there's a, I wanna reinforce a few. But the first is to understand the lived experience of others in as authentic a way as possible. And in the past, we might have thought we were doing that. We did the management by walking around thing, which goes all the way back to the book In Search of Excellence. We you know, felt that we were asking people questions what were going on in their lives. Then we got on the first Zoom call as the COVID lockdowns came in and we said, oh, wait a minute, you have a cat? You have kids? You have a sick aunt living in, I didn't know any of those things. Right. Well, no, so you weren't actually connected to them as human beings. And I'm not saying that you, this has to be performative. I'm not saying that you have to spend all this time in, in pretending to be interested in what people have going on in their lives. No, this needs to be authentic. And you, but you also have to understand that they have a range of experiences and capacity to bring to the organization that you need to understand. 
Yes. Uh, it's helpful to know the hobbies that people have. It's helpful to know the kinds of background that they've had in other industries that could be tremendously useful as a team is trying to solve problems. Absolutely. So the, the trust is going to come from a two-way street of continually putting out opportunities to be able to co-create, solve problems together, or to give others the chance to solve problems where you as the team guy don't even have to step in. That is how trust gets instantiated. The more you give people that power to be able to solve problems on their own and only coming to you as they need help, the greater the trust they're going to have that you will have their back in, when challenging problems occur in the future. Yeah, I think that is really helpful. It's a two-way street, opening up those opportunities and really guiding people as well. There are some kind of phrases around the world of work that, you know, people think that are here to stay and, you know, what needs to be successful. So I want to read a couple of those and kind of ask your opinion on whether they are true or false. The first is around, you know, what we've experienced in terms of a remote first world uh, and the response to kind of COVID and quarantine. So flexible work is here to stay, true or false? Uh, depends on the company. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm weaseling on a number of these things. Depends on the company. But yes, as a trend in the way that, that more and more workers will be able to choose the context of where, when, how, and why they work. Yes, there will be much more flexible work. Okay, that's, I mean, context is really important. So that's okay if you put nuance <laughs> in these. Uh, the next one is people leave because of people and stay because of people. For the most part, yes. There are people who are, there are workers who are very driven by the work itself and are in work contexts where the people matter the people environment matters, but the work itself is what defines their, their happiness and success. For most workers, yes, the people, and especially that team guy or traditional manager, number one, like that's the number one reason people say that they leave jobs is because they, they had a credit manager. Yeah, I think, th I think that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like I could pull up a couple anecdotal examples of where that's the case. I'm sure they'd be hypothetical. I'm sure they wouldn't have actually been your own real experience. Oh, absolutely. But, absolutely. Yeah. A friend of yeah. a friend, you know, uh, yeah. next one is around uh, an employee's happiness. So it is an organization's responsibility to ensure that employees are happy. I, I say no. I, I rather I, I put it in my framing, which is that happiness is actually a very difficult metric by which an organization tries to guide decisions that it makes about its culture and about its workers, because happiness is cultural. Uh, there, there are cultures that actually would say a company that thinks it's responsible for the happiness, I mean, cultures around the world, yeah. is actually, that's, that's not its job, like that's not its responsibility. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't co-create a culture where everybody agrees, yes, happiness is one of the metrics by which we should guide ourselves. However, I would urge you to go another layer below that. What is it that you believe contributes to happiness? And those are the things you should focus on because happiness can be ephemeral, it can be subjective, it can be something that if you, if you try to index on it, and people feel they have to keep on saying, oh, I'm five on a scale of one to five for happiness today. Uh, because if you say you're on two, then your team guide or your traditional manager is going to get slammed because what all your team today said they're twos. Why are they twos today? What did you do? What did you do wrong? You don't want to get guided by these metrics that can be very, very subjective and that it's the underpinnings that drive them whether people are doing work they feel they're effective in, whether they feel they're growing in their work, whether they feel involved in the organization, whether they feel aligned with the other workers in the organization. Those are the four things I point to that can drive happiness, that can encourage happiness, but happiness itself, not so much. Sounds like getting specific is important, really breaking it down into those pillars and what is driving that kind of feeling because yeah. happiness is really hard to measure as well. Uh, the yeah. next one is around company culture. So company culture is subjective. So having a healthy or unhealthy company culture is also subjective. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You can, you can, uh, I would say, you know, in the past, you could tell in Silicon Valley, there are people who would thrive at Google and people who would thrive at Oracle. And it's not the same person. Like, that, I mean, the cultures maybe, you know, yeah. this, you can argue there are parts of their cultures now that are not that dissimilar, depending upon the, the department. But there are definitely cultures where people feel they have found their tribe, they feel that tremendously they're in the right place, and put into another culture totally unhappy or totally unsuccessful. So yeah, very subjective. That's fair. That's fair. I feel like people who want to work at a startup is very different than someone who wants to work for a company that's been established for 20 or even 100 years. It's a different person. Um, And everybody in terms of happiness for what we talked about are looking for different things at different points of their lives as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, you hit the nail. Yeah. Um, another question I have for you, so moving on from the kind of true and false statements here, uh, is around folks who really want to refresh their talent management strategy. So we talked a lot about change, being proactive, being ready uh, to have that dynamic strategy. What's your recommendation for refreshing a company's talent management process in 2022? What are some things that you know need to be thought about, questions to ask themselves? So I think of it as a series of phases. Um, uh, and, and you know, talent management is a phrase we use nowadays. So again, I'm not going to be the word police on everything, but uh, we, if, if every worker is talented, then I'm all in. Um, and if management means that we're helping to guide talent uh, to match up to the kinds of problems that are most effective for everybody, then I'm all in. So a couple of things to, to refresh the way, again, I'll start with mindset and then we'll go to skill set and tool set. The mindset really needs to be that you have a pool of problem solvers and a pool of problems to solve. If you still think in terms of hierarchy, then your hiring practices, the way that you define work roles, the way you onboard people, the way you help people to develop are all going to be much more structured and strictured by these, what I call the old rules of work, you know, as opposed to If you're thinking of the next rules where you have a range of problem solvers who are just continually adept at dynamically binding around new problems, and you've enabled those talented people to be able to match up to the, or or to find or create the work roles where they can solve those problems. That's the mindset to have, because then what you do is you do a number of different things. Soften the walls of the organization so that you have mentorships, apprenticeships, uh, anything that you can do to help people onboard in steps into the organization, you always have access to this tremendously talented pool of people that could be helping to solve the problems of your organization's stakeholders. Second is to think from a mindset standpoint that this is a network of people. I call it a work net. It's not a workforce. It's a work net. It's a network of people. And your job, if you are helping to manage that talent, is to continually have the dynamic processes where they are matching up to the problems to be solved. And so that means then you have to think of every worker as an enterprise resource. A worker can't be owned by a manager. It has to be a set of skills that they can bring to bear on problems throughout the organization. Now, that doesn't mean anarchy. It means a set of projects problem-centric work and project-centric work, and that projects are continually known and available throughout the organization. Sure, you got a day job or a major area of focus, but there are other problems, other teams you can be helping to solve problems on. And then finally, I tell, because talent management is often going to fall onto the shoulders of HR, I say, look, you can be the change that you want to see. You actually can manage yourself this way. Embed yourself in the different departments and divisions that you are helping. Don't just sit in the, you know, back in the, you know, the center mothership office. You should be part of those organizations that you're trying to help. You should have these kind of roles that allow you to dynamically bind around problems and authentically be connected to the needs of the talent within the organization. And you should be their advocate. You should be the one that is continually modeling, building what I call the most involving or inclusive organization. You should be able to look around that organization and see that you have the kinds of people that you're telling everybody else in the company to hire. Uh, And you should be cross-fertilizing, you know, and hiring people outside of traditional HR backgrounds. All of those things will help you to contribute to a much more effective talent management strategy. 
I think that's important to think of it in terms of also how you wrote uh, the next rules of work as well, mindset, skill set, and tool set, and having that mindset of not thinking about hierarchy, really projects and problem-based teams and kind of mission there is, is important too in terms of motivation and thinking about who needs to solve those problems, making sure that there's a variety of opinions in the room too for innovation. I do want to bring up the book in terms of what inspired you to write the next rules of work. Um, and, you know, I know it's an entire book, but I want to, I do want to ask you that question. So I've been thinking about these issues for a long time. Um, I, you know, was trained in the family business. So as a career counselor, I kind of understood how people change careers. Um, where I felt there was a tremendous amount of opportunity was to help people, especially in an organizational context, whether it's a startup or a, you know, a scaled multinational corporation, to be thinking about how we're channeling human energy. And as I, I came to lecture more and more on this um, through uh, my work with Singularity University and, and kept you know, uh, synthesizing a lot of the input that I got from people and organizations all around the world, what I realized, what I felt was that we're, we were coming up for a really big shift. That is, we're hitting an inflection point. This is pre-COVID, where we, and I, just, I would say this in lectures that are, many of which are, are online bef before the virus hit us, that we're going to look back in 10 years and say, we rewrote the rules of work. Already, so many of the changes that I've been talking about in the roles of, of the team guide, in the way to think about organizations meeting the needs of their stakeholders. I mean, we'd speak about this for a long time and then along came a virus and we just pressed the accelerator to the floor. So uh, I actually was very lucky when you talk about catalysts. Um, uh, my wife who is also my business partner, uh, Heidi, she, she in January of 2020, she suggested I go off and spend a month in a, um, an Airbnb <laughs> and write the first draft of the book. Well, it just right. happened to be just before this virus came along and uh, and so it gave me a chance, even before the influence of COVID, to think through so many of these changes. And then what COVID did was it changed some of the priorities, more distributed work, much faster than it would ever have happened before, uh, much more leaving workers in place than it would ever have happened before. And these were all trends I'd been pushing for before. COVID changed some of the priorities and the timing. But aside from that, no, I felt that we were going to look back in 10 years and say, this was the inflection point. And I, I believe that, that our response to the virus just absolutely accelerated things so much faster than I could ever have thought. Yeah, I think channeling the work of folks and really empowering them to do their best work is really important. You seem really passionate about it. And now is the time to encourage folks to think about the future of work and how they want to co-create it as well, um, as we were discussing. Um, and in terms of your experience in you know, the field and lecturing and being a career counselor, I saw this question in diversity in academia that I have been asking folks as well in terms of when you're doing this work, um, how does your kind of privilege serve you and how are you using it to create more equity in the space? So first off, I think, you know, the, the, the dialogue around privilege and position resources and so on, uh, we, you know, there's, there's no, there's no Fitbit for privilege, right? right? So we don't, we don't have a little marker that we can all look at and say, uh, okay, let me see yours. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm much more advantaged than you. Um, so instead, what I think we need is self-awareness, right? So that's what you push for first, is that people, first off, understand what is it that got you here, <laughs> and uh, and you're still alive. So, so something helped, something advantaged you uh, to be able to still be on the planet. And uh, But everybody's lived experience. We all follow different paths. It's just that some of those advantages are much more explicit. Um, and so for me, what I've found is, uh, you know, I'm the son of a small town minister, you know, we were extremely poor family living in Passaic, New Jersey when I was little and, and, uh, but I've been given an opportunity to be able to learn from a range of people around the world who are tremendously empowered, have tremendous agency have been great problem solvers. And what I've found to me, um, my father talks a lot about mission in life, mission with a capital M. <laughs> what I've found is I think an opportunity for me is to be able to learn from all of these different people and then to use whatever pulpit I have, whatever, whatever chance I have, whether it's the book or lectures or my courses on LinkedIn learning or 
is to be able to try to synthesize some of those insights, to be able to make them as available as possible to as many people as possible. So that to me is, is the, what I feel is an appropriate way to leverage the advantages that I've had is if, if you know, I've got 900,000 learners now on LinkedIn Learning. To me, that's, that's the potential to be able to infect 900,000 people with some possibility to take action or do something different in their lives or have an insight they might not have had otherwise. That is one of the greatest opportunities any of us can have is to be able to try to reach as many people as possible to infect them with the possibilities to take action so that they can have a more positive future. Absolutely. Accessibility and opportunity to just like these resources um, and this knowledge is really important as well. I mean, we've talked about a lot of kind of research that you've done, storytelling and just sharing kind of your insights with the world. What is the thing that is currently taking up the most brain space in Gary's mind? What is keeping you up at night right now? Uh, well, not, not a lot of things. Thankfully, not a lot of things keep me up at night. So <laughs> um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a night owl, so I'm up at night anyway, but, uh, but uh, you know, that helps me sleep a lot better. So, but um, a couple of things. So first off, uh, I, I'm always uh, trying as much as possible to find a way to put myself in a new situation to learn something new, which is always a little uncomfortable. So the author thing, that's kind of new. I'm not, you know, my, my father was good at it. Now I'm learning at it, learning the process. And uh, so there's a lot to learn. <laughs> and, um, but I'd say more than anything is I feel a sense of urgency. I feel like with this pivot that so many of us are doing in the world of work is that there's a unique time. We have a window to try to catalyze as much new thinking and that new mindset and as much you know, developing a new skill set as possible. And I don't want that window to close. I, I, I use a, when I lecture, I use a picture of a bungee cord, you know, so we, we jump off the cliff, but then it pulls us back. So we all jumped off this cliff with COVID and now we've got this sort of bungee cording of all wanting to get back to the office and get yeah. back to our old ways of working and that sort of thing. And I think that would be a fail. I think that would be a fail for many of us. I think instead we've got a window where we can encourage behavioral change. We can encourage a new mindset. We can build more inclusive organizations. We can meet the needs of a broader set of stakeholders. And I, have, I feel a strong sense of urgency We've got to strike while the iron is hot. We're we're open to these things, you know, from the the rethinking that many have gone through with what's often called the great resignation, which is basically, as far as I'm concerned, people very appropriately just doing their own career planning um, <laughs> and feeling empowered to do it. Right. Uh, to to this this transition to more distributed work that a lot of organizations are trying to get their arms around. All of those require a new mindset. And, but if we keep on using the old mindset, we're going to go back and we're just going to sort of bungee cord ourselves back into the ways that we used to do things. And so I, I feel that's what pushes me the most is to try to reach as many people as possible to encourage them to be able to instantiate these, these new ways of thinking, this new way of working, to be more collaborative and connected to others. That's our opportunity. And I feel, I feel a strong sense of urgency. You know, I don't want that window to close. Yes, the time, the time again is is now for this change, for this changing of the mindset. We've talked a lot about team guides, uh, co-collaboration, really keeping a pulse on what's happening within your organization to really create that Venn diagram of company culture and continuing to be dynamic and being proactive. Gary, is there a key insight that you hope that listeners take with them after listening to our conversation or anything I didn't ask that you want to share uh, for our final question? Oh, absolutely. So first off, you're you're marvelous at synthesizing what I say. So you you you're doing oh, a, a incredible <laughs> job of hitting hitting all the key points. So um, that's I think that's a that's a marvelous gift to your listeners. Uh, but I'd say I'd say one thing is it's often uh, what I what I found is very helpful is if you're thinking of trying to affect cultural change um, uh, writ large within an organization or you know within a, a single team or even just with your own behavior is it's really, really important to have a, the, the approach, the mindset of, of understanding, getting as much of a finger on the pulse right now, the way that you think your own behavior, the things that you're doing now, and then how you could envision what even one change might be, and then dedicating to that one change. The, the, the big, you know, no question, you should be trying to encourage and catalyze cultural change throughout the organization. 
it's often, I think back to your original question, this combination of doing things across a broader landscape, but also what you as an individual do. Let's never punt to somebody else. <laughs> Always look at what's the one step you can do and now, like today or tomorrow, a single step that actually embodies, that acts out the kind of behavior change that you want to see, even if it makes you a little bit uncomfortable. That's what I would encourage your listeners to do is don't, don't leave this to the longer scale, longer term change. Don't leave, do something smaller today or tomorrow yourself so that you can actually be moving in that direction as well. Incredible. I think that's a good call to action to end on. Everyone can be that culture champion as well. Thank you so much, Gary, for being on Reimagining Company Culture. I enjoyed our conversation. No, that was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we believe in employee feedback management and really uh, actively curating that psychological safety. And we know that hearing from All Voices is really important for the companies to succeed as a whole. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone.